is here is started. Okay, so today in this technical seminar from the uh, open source uh, drink community, I'm going to talk about uh, macroservice architecture for scientific applications. So uh, this is work we have been uh, working on uh, at North here, with, uh, led by Eric Ayeu. Uh, this comes uh, right after the previous technical seminar uh, organized here, uh, which was talking about uh, YPL correction of uh, real meter measurements. So you will see uh, that today I will present a uh, general principle of um, the microservice architecture, but particularly focused on the application that uh, was presented uh, last time by, by Eric. So let's jump into it. The, the outline of the presentation today is, um, is the following. So I'll start with a general introduction on microservices. And then a few slides on uh, what is it to handle microservices in practice. And I will jump to this uh, uh, application uh, regarding uh, correction of real meter measurements. And after that, I will show you an example implementation to try to, to debunk uh, the, uh, the, the complexity of uh, what we could feel about microservices from the first uh, at a first sight and then i will uh, show you uh, another application that we have been uh, conducting uh, regarded to automated drilling engineering and where we have applied this uh, microservice architecture and i will finish with uh, a conclusion and the uh, and try to sum up the pros and cons of uh, this architecture so uh, first, as an introduction, uh, this is important to have in, in mind uh, what we call the uh, MVC pattern. Uh, so model view controller, this is a, a very standard and uh, uh, widely used software design pattern uh, that basically consists in dividing uh, the different components of a program into a model where all the logic, uh, the the algorithms, the da data, classes, and objects uh, of your problem, of your scientific problem, uh, will be uh, defined uh, into a um, controller that will handle the communication between these data, simulations, algorithms, and a view, which will represent the presentation layer of your application. So this uh, model has been um, invented in the 70s by Trick Verenskau uh, and the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center uh, to uh, develop the one of the first object-oriented programming languages, which is called uh, Smalltalk. And the particularity of this uh, language was that it was integrated into an IDE, uh, which has a strong graphic component. So what is important about this uh, model MVC pattern is that basically this is a, a way of thinking about how to implement uh, your application um, um, in a quite, yeah, in a general way. And this actually applies, this way of separating the three components applies to um, many kind of software architecture and at different scales. So during this presentation today, you will see that different concept that will be bring out uh, will actually um, closely match this, uh, this concept, uh, MVC concept. So usually when we talk about microservice architecture, we first talk about uh, what was before microservices. And uh, now in the jargon of this uh, microservice architecture, uh, we have found what we call monolithic architecture. So traditional architecture. Um, so uh, on the sketch, on the picture on the right, you can see what how a monolithic architecture can be, can be sketched. Uh, so basically um, it follows the MVC pattern in the sense that you have this user interface, which is the view, the data, the business logic, which represent the model. 
and the data access layer, which represent the controllers and how you handle your model and data and send that to uh, the user interface for either visualization or post-processing. Uh, but depending on how you decide to implement your monolithic architecture, uh, you can apply this MVC pattern more or less. It depends actually on you. So you will see a lot for a lot of small scale scientific applications where this MVC uh, layers, different layers are applied, uh, but usually they run, uh, you run them uh, within a single thread or process. And sometimes you will also see that this pattern has simply been ignored. Uh, and in which case the logic, the controllers and the view will be kind of mixed together uh, so that it starts getting uh, complex and hard to enter into the code and understand how the application works. But once you start getting into larger scale application, generally, this is very difficult to avoid applying this uh, MVC pattern because your application starts would, if you wouldn't apply this uh, pattern, your, your application would start being uh, um, unmaintainable. So this is very common to, to see this uh, pattern applied for monolithic architecture. So um, a characteristic of this architecture is that the, um, so it's usually run within one single process. And that makes that these applications are usually fast to run uh, because the access to the data is straightforward. Uh, also, we, if one needs to update the program, uh, the code, uh, it's necessary to rebuild everything because all the components uh, of the program are um, integrated together. Uh, there is also this aspect that when you intend to scale up your application to reach uh, a wider base of user, uh, this requires to duplicate your application, basically to install this application on a given laptop or workstation uh, as a different um, a duplicate. So you need to ask the user to download this application and to install it, basically. So this is monolithic architecture. Historically, there have been a second, um, a very important range of uh, software design architecture, which is called SOA, Service Oriented Architecture. So in this case, uh, the architecture, as you can see on the on picture on the right, is, is quite different because the application is broken down into services uh, that are developed and deployed independently. Uh, so a service can be either a service provider or a service consumer. Some services may just define some data and data models. Some others may use this data uh, and perform computation or processing or whatever. And some can do both, actually. Uh, and the particularity of this uh, service-oriented architecture is also that there is an inter-service communication uh, in the shape of uh, enterprise service bus, as you can see on the right, uh, that allows the data to be transferred from one service to another and eventually to be uh, used by a user interface or, or um, posted to a user interface so that results or data can be visualized by the user. Again, if we stick to this, if we want to understand this, as a, a kind of particular case of the MVC pattern, we can see here that uh, the service is basically where the model is defined. Uh, the view is the UI, the user interface, and the controller is basically the bus where data will be exchanged and handled between services. So this is the big picture, but at a smaller scale, uh, we, could all, we could also perfectly uh, try to implement this MVC pattern within each service, for example, where a service could add, has its own data model, where your data is defined, but also a view that could be implemented in a given service. This view, for example, would help you to uh, visualize the, this particular service data or results 
if you are running simulations, for example. So this could be a view that helps you to test this particular uh, service. And it could also uh, have its own controller that, again, handles the transfer of data between the model and the view. And we could say the same with the user interface. So uh, another characteristics of this uh, SOA is that uh, there is usually one single permanent that data storage, which is represented uh, here at the bottom right. Um, and it's also um, possible, so this is one of the, the advantages of this uh, architecture, that it's possible to develop and deploy services in them independently uh, from each other's. Uh, expect, except, sorry, when there are changes at the level of the communication bus, in which case this could affect the whole process. Um, so another advantage of this uh, architecture is that it's uh, quite easy uh, to scale up and the, um, the services by duplicating the services. So you don't have to duplicate the whole application, you just duplicate what is needed. So for example, if you realize that a lot of users go into the use of a particular service, but not another one, you just duplicate this service. So in terms of hardware or resource management, this is much more flexible than a monolithic architecture. And as um, an evolution of the service-oriented architecture, we now have the microservice architecture. So the difference here with the SOA is that um, microservices are um, composed of a suite of small services that have their own um, domain scope uh, that will help to uh, work uh, that will help that these services work as independently from each other as possible. They are independently deployable and scalable. Um, they are also independent in the way that, contrary to the SOA, they all usually uh, owns their um, their own have their own local storage, which helps, uh, which avoids having a system which is continuously um, monitoring and handling data coming from different services. And if this data storage fail, that would um, that put, put the whole system at risk. Whereas in this case, since they have their own local data storage, if one microservice fails, it doesn't affect uh, how other microservices will act, um, uh, access their own uh, data storage. Um, um, a, very, um, a very interesting advantage of uh, the, the microservice architecture is that uh, all these microservices, since they are designed to be run independently and deployed independently, they can also work uh, in under the, they can also be deployed and developed, sorry, uh, in different programming language uh, or framework and even systems. So you can develop one microservice in, in C Sharp or Java or Python, uh, and you can develop it under Linux, Windows, or any other uh, system you like, or framework. If you have different version of a framework, uh, you could uh, develop uh, one microservice with this combination and another with another, another combination. And this is usually uh, acknowledged that this is one of the best, uh, one of the main advantage of the microservice architecture because it allows people and teams and groups to work together independently. And uh, if a group decide to work in a particular environment, uh, it's not affected it's not affecting another group that works somewhere else in the world and that have other um, resources um, uh, they are used to use. Um, another characteristics of the um, microservice architecture is that usually the API, which is the application programming interface, which is basically the way you access the feature and the capability of a given microservice is very simple. We will see an example of that. 
Um, and it typically adheres to what we used to call the CRUD API, CRUD meaning create, read, update, and delete. We will see an example of that later on. Um, the communication pipeline between microservices, uh, contrary to service-oriented architecture, uh, is not a bus uh, that stick everything together, but it's simply uh, the, the network. So it can be a local network of the internet, and there are several uh, available um, protocols that can be used to communicate between microservices, uh, the most usual one being the HTTP uh, protocol. Um, and another important characteristics of these microservices is that they are containerized, uh, which basically <coughs> means and allows uh, the, um, these different microservices uh, to, um, to be developed in uh, different systems, framework, and languages, as I explained uh, before. So uh, we will come back on this contena containerization process because it's very important. And this is what allows to have this very loosely coupled microservices uh, that do not depend at all on hardware. And if and uh, that allows that if one microservices fail, all the other uh, can still continue to, to work. Um, and again, uh, just like the SOA architecture, uh, microservices are easily scalable uh, because they are really independent um, so that um, you can simply add more instance or replica uh, if you need, and just like SOA, you can focus on, on a particular microservice uh, if you want to scale it up uh, and not scale up another one if it's not necessary. So today, uh, the idea is not to, uh, to say that uh, microservice architecture is better than uh, the other, the other architecture, the other type of architecture I've been presenting, uh, basically depends on your uh, needs. So um, usually, and most of the time for scientific application, monolithic architecture will be enough uh, because you will be able to handle your input, outputs, and simulations uh, very conveniently, and provided that you um, respect this MVC pattern and um, general um, software design principle, uh, you will have the ability to run um, your application locally, even if it's uh, within one process or several processes or threads, if you have implemented parallel some parallel computation, um, and that will make it. So SOA and microservices from the start are more applied to applications that require, require um, that goes through the internet or local network. So typically, um, um, microservice architecture is useful for business and commercial applications that target a wide community, community of users. Um, and Actually, this is where if you go in the internet and find some documentation or literature uh, in the field of uh, microservices, you will see that most of the documentation, the en almost entirety of the documentation uh, applies to business and commercial applications. Still, uh, yeah, no, before the still, <laughs> I want to insist on this point that, um, so all these architecture are good provided that you respect this, the, the following principle that you can see here. Uh, readability, which means that provided that your code is readable, that you have been structuring it um, in, a, in, a, in a sense, uh, in a reasonable way, uh, it's okay. All, all architecture will make it. Uh, if you apply this single responsibility principle that tells that a function or a class or a method should have a single responsibility, so should be responsible of doing one thing and not a mix, a mix up of different 
functionalities or different computations or handling too many different data, provided that you respect this and you try to focus, uh, to, to limit the focus of your classes and methods, uh, your, your code will be easily readable and maintainable. Modularity goes the same. It's the same idea behind that you want to have this possibility to, um, to connect different modules to your application. And this is possible to do in any kind of architecture. Pluggability also very important when you go to, to professional application that you, you intend to sell. Uh, you want to ensure, to make sure that uh, you are able to build a new model or a new plugin to your application that is easily connect uh, pluggable to the existing ones and unpluggable if you need to deactivate some, some plugins for a specific user or a client. Maintainability, this is obviously uh, very important to have an application that you will run for several years and to maintain and evolutivity which is also a very important uh, problem uh, because when you increase, the, for example, the complexity of your model, with, whether it is a simulation or a process, uh, whatever, you need to um, account for the future and makes that when you will add new features to your, um, to your program, this will be easily done. And this is where microservices architecture is very interesting for scientific application, because actually, if you enter this uh, wonderful world of the microservice uh, architecture development, you will be actually more uh, kind of forced to respect this principle uh, in, a, in a stronger way than if you go into a monolithic architecture. So. Uh, this will al allow you also to small, um, to couple your algorithms, uh, whether they are uh, written in different languages or not. So particularly for the OSDC, uh, this is important because we are assembling together different pieces of models that are related to the drilling uh, activity, the drilling field. And obviously we are working uh, different teams and groups are working uh, for the same purpose. And this is where microservice architecture can be very interesting because this helps connect easily between these uh, different groups and, uh, and uh, resources. Uh, so the only, the, the main constraint that you will have is that with these microservices, so you need to deploy them, but you need also to expose the model. What are the data that are handled by this microservice so that others in other groups could use this microservice. So I will come back on this. Um, and once this is done, this other team just needs some adapter, which are basically some classes or a small uh, conversion classes that helps you, that helps them uh, convert their own data in their own language or system into the data that is understood by this other microservice. And once you have this adapter, you are able to discuss and communicate with this microservice that has been developed by someone else. But it comes with a cost, and this cost is a communication layer, just like the OCA SOA, um, because you need to implement an additional layer of communication, and this is not something which is um, necessary for the monolithic architecture. Fortunately, and I will try to show you that uh, later on, uh, once this communication layer is in place, uh, it's it's, there is no additional cost. So the initial cost is to implement this, but afterwards uh, it's, it just continues as uh, sim as simply as uh, in a monolithic architecture. So I talked about this uh, important concept of containerization. Uh, so here is it. Um, so these microservices are typically run into containers, which consist in package of 
all the resources required to run a given application. So you see here on this picture on the left, the difference between what would be an application which is running on a physical server, what that we call bare metal, you have the operating system and different applications that have been uh, installed on this server. Uh, and you basically need to connect to the server if you want to run any of these applications. Um, in the, so there is a second stage uh, in the virtualization uh, process uh, that you have probably um, used in the past, most of you. Uh, these are the virtual machine. So virtual machine are very convenient tool that allows you to uh, to handle um, uh, copies of entire system onto your laptop or a given uh, workstation. Uh, in and this application may run on a different system or has been has to be built in a different environment, in different framework, or is using a a language that uh, is not available on your machine. This is packaged in the virtual machine and you just have in to install this virtual machine on your, on your laptop, execute this virtual machine, and within this virtual machine, you will be able to run the application of interest. This is a very interesting concept that offers much more flexibility than the bare metal and that allows, allows to deploy uh, very easily a code that has been implemented in, implemented in particular uh, environment. But there is this problem that a virtual machine can be very, uh, very heavy in terms of uh, memory. And this is where uh, containers and containerization tool have been invented. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, different uh, containerization tool, the most uh, famous being Docker, but you have others. Uh, and the advantage of this uh, configuration is that basically these containers are sharing the same operating system. Uh, they just need a container engine, which is installed on your machine. So for example, on my laptop, I've installed Docker with the Docker engine that runs uh, this engine for me. And each time I receive a container or I want to use or build one of the container uh, for my the application I'm working on, I can simply um, pull them, pull these containers and execute them. And that's a very lighter process than the virtual machines. Um, each container potentially works, uh, runs any system. This can be Linux here. This can be Windows here. Uh, this, the applications that are embedded into this container can be can have been developed in, uh, in Java, in C Sharp, in whatever, at a given version of the system or the environment, it will work exactly the same, provided that it has, it has been packaged as a, con as a con container. And this is a job of Docker to do that. So this is very important, and this uh, offers both flexibility and a light way of uh, deploying application. So in practice, let's go to a few. So how would you, so let's focus on uh, scientific applications now. Uh, so this example here is for a monolithic computational process. What would you do in a standard application that you would have to implement? Uh, basically you would, have, you would implement a user interface while you ask your user to define data. Data can be physical object, boundary conditions, field data, and give parameters for simulations. And then you pass this data to your scientific algorithm, your model, uh, that will uh, basically retrieve the inputs from the user interface after some uh, user interface event has been triggered, run based on this data, uh, will run algorithm and generate outputs. And this is done in the same process, right? And after these outputs have been generated, they can be retrieved by the user interface, either for visualization, if it's a user interface, but this user interface could also be another, basically another process or another algorithm 
that you intend to pass the data to, the results, in order to post-process them, to filter them or whatever, and to visualize them at a later stage. So this is quite simple. We have been, I guess, implementing such tools, uh, all of us uh, in, in, the, in the past. And I will show you now what is the process for uh, microservices uh, architecture. So basically, uh, there is a clear distinction between the user interface and the microservices. The microservices in itself is just responsible for handling a given algorithm, uh, performing a given task, a given uh, computational task in this example. So what it needs, this is an a priori here, a post, uh, postulate, it needs to expose its model to the outside world. This is uh, um, uh, prerequisite. So usually what is done, so this microservice uh, is able to, to run its own algorithm and exposes this model in the shape of a JSON, JSON uh, schema. JSON is a, it's, um, uh, um, a markup language format, just like XML, but in this is a, a lighter version of uh, 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 than uh, XML. Uh, and this allows to, so this is um, usually, uh, these are uh, usually um, shared as uh, files, uh, text files usually, uh, that allows, so this is a structured language that allows to um, map any object oriented or structural language like C, C Sharp, uh, Java, whatever, uh, into a common and unified uh, way, just like XML. So this is the uh, prerequisite. And then the user interface, user interface come into play, come into play. And based on the JSON schema that has been exposed by this microservice, uh, and that is available for this user interface, we will build objects that respect this JSON schema. schema. Uh, and we build them according to a logic or um, definitions that have given by this team. And then at a, a third stage, this um, data that have been designed here will be converted back into JSON instances. And at this stage, uh, whatever is the programming language that you have used in your user interface, it can be a web design uh, language. It can be also based languages like C Sharp, Python, or MATLAB. You will have available a JSON library that allows you to do this conversion. And this conversion will allow you to send the data from the user interface to the microservices you want to send requests to in this uh, general, general and standardized uh, format, which is JSON. And this is where the law, the, the, the um, so this step, sorry, is uh, conducted through the network, right? So we send this through the network. As I said earlier, this can be through HTTP request. Then the microservice receives this request as a JSON uh, instance and needs to convert back this JSON instance into a data object. So uh, the data object, which is understood by the microservice, again, that can be C-sharp, Python, or MATLAB, but that can be different from the, the choice you have made here. It can be C-sharp here, and that can be Java here. So this is very important that the JSON here, the use of the JSON standard here allows you to have this decoupling between uh, the languages you use in the, the, in the client, here and in the microservice here. And then once you have converted back your JSON instance into a data object that, this, that is understandable by the microservice, you can execute your business logic, meaning the scientific algorithm, and with the inputs that have been uh, sent uh, and built here, you are able to run your algorithm, generate the outputs, and the data instance you have been generated, so the results, basically, the simulation results, can be added to the microservice database. And eventually, 
this database can be interrogated back by the user interface once the simulation has been run and the, the, the microservice has done its job. And the user interface receives back this data object after they have been converted again into a JSON instance. And they are received by the user interface, converted back into JSON, into a data object that is understandable by the user interface, and they can be visualized. So as you can see here, the process is a little bit more complex, but not so much. Basically, we, are, we have just this intermediate layer uh, that uses JSON that, um, that is in between the building of the data and the execution of the algorithm, which is here. So this communication layer uh, usually respect what we call the crude principle I was mentioning before. So crude, basically, um, this is a standard that tends to simplify as much as possible the operations that you are doing on the web or on the local network where you are running your microservices. So uh, crude uh, means create, read, update, and delete. So these are the operations you will be um, you will, will be bound to. Uh, so in um, HTTP nomenclature, create is usually uh, is called post uh, method, whereas uh, read is called get, put, uh, update is called put, and delete is, is called delete. What is important in the REST principle is that when you get, when you read the data from a given service or microservice, uh, you don't change the state of the data. You just access it to have a look at it, but you don't modify it. And this is why uh, this is what we call RESTful application. So this is an important principle. You only modify your data when you put or when you post. Um, so typical payload, so exchange, the format in which we exchange data is JSON. It can also be XML, which is another structured language, as I said, that is able to uh, mimic the uh, structure of your data or classes that you have been implementing in your application. Um, so these are very simple, but in case you need more uh, a variety of them, because between this microservices and this other microservices, you need to exchange data that are a little bit more complex than just uh, exchanging a get, one get. You can just um, add uh, more, uh, a little bit more complexity to the API in order to access different uh, sort of data. I will show you an example of that right after. So here is the example microservice API of the application related to re, uh, correction of real meter measurements. So Eric has been uh, presenting uh, during the last seminar. Uh, so in this application, I don't enter into the detail of the application itself. But the API is available here. And we have um, also embedded into the code um, um, Swagger, uh, the Swagger tool, which allows you to visualize this API uh, in a very uh, convenient way. So this is what you see on the left here. And you see that these are, for example, so in this microservice, so this is the microservice which perform the correction and the calibration of Reometer measurements, um, you have access to different kinds of objects, quetreometers, drilling physical quantities, but also rheogram, et cetera. And for all these data objects, you have a corresponding crude API, get post. And you, have, you can see that you have a get method that allows you to access so this is what is given as an example here. If you apply the get method here, so in this case, uh, this is I'm trying to access rheograms. So this is the get method that corresponds to rheograms. I, this returns to me a list of identifier of the different rheograms that are stored on the database. So these identifiers, we have decided to apply, uh, to use identifier as uh, defined as GUID, which is a very uh, widespread way of identifying uniquely data um, 
uh, avoiding to have um, uh, duplicates of the same IDs. So you, in every programming language, you have access to um, uh, features um, that uh, generate this grid automatically and randomly for you. And uh, the, the chance of having two duplicates of the same ID are very, very low because as you can see, uh, here we are using hexadecimal, uh, yeah, actually 32 occurrences of uh, hexadecimal number that makes it uh, very um, unlikely uh, to have uh, ID duplicates. So this is an example of calling the get method. But if you want to call um, one uh, heogram in particular, you apply, you use the same uh, endpoint here, so the same address. So if I come back to the original address, this is this one, you see, a YPL calibration for millimeter API rail run. This gives me access to the list of available rail run. And if I come, if I want to access one rheogram in particular, I just add the ID of this rheogram. And this is what I get in return. This is a JSON file, which is structured, as you can see, with all the attributes of my object in a JSON format. Now, this is an example of how you would use this microservice directly from a web browser. But it, now, if you want you to use it programmatically, so if you want, for example, to access our microservice here, YPL calibration from a home meter, from your application, this is how you would say. So it looks a bit tricky, but actually it's not so much. Because basically what you need to do is to set up an HTTP client. So you have uh, definitely uh, libraries to help you to do that in any of the programming language that you will uh, work with. So in this case, I'm calling set HTTP client, client we, because we are working in, in .NET. And this is what is available um, uh, as a standard. I just simply add here the host which is a Norse uh, um, hosted server, app.digiworlds.no. And here, what we call an endpoint, which is where the microservice YPL calibration for Melmeta is uh, defined. So I have my HTTP client, and then I need to formulate a request, HTTP, uh, by asking, please give me access to the list of programs. And I just call this method on the HTTP client, and that will return me a string here that I need to convert. So this will be a JSON string, basically. And I will, to convert, I will convert this into the appropriate uh, data object that is useful for me and that my, my own application is able to understand. For example, here, this is an array of GUID, but this could be also a list of Reogram or any kind of dictionary of whatever data you are working with. And this again requires a library. And usually in most of the programming language, you have these JSON uh, libraries that are available to do the conversion in one direction, encoding or other direction, decoding. So these, these are really standard and uh, possible to develop in any language. Um, I don't enter into the detail of the post, put, and delete method. It works basically the same. And we can discuss this together later on if you are interested in go uh, further detail. Uh, but here, uh, this has been possible to encode and decode uh, this JSON string because uh, the JSON schema I was mentioning earlier has been made available. And this is. Also, so Swagger that we use, the tool that we use here to visualize our API is also able to uh, give you the uh, JSON schema that corresponds to any objects that you are uh, manipulating in your, in your application. So for your information, the JSON schema for our microservice YPL calibration for millimeter is available either through Swagger, as I just said, or you can also have the whole JSON schema which is available here on GitHub uh, of the uh, OSDC. Um, okay, I will go 
quick on this, um, very quick, uh, but basically we have also implemented, um, okay, each time you need you develop a new microservice, you need to test it basically and verify that when I want to get a given program, uh, I get it. Uh, when I want to create a new one with new data, I'm able to do it and that works. Uh, to do it, to do this, you could do this uh, programmatically and develop your own testing code of the micro, for the microservices. But you have also the capability to, uh, you have some tools like Insomnia or Postman, which are the, one of the most famous, that allows you to do this test in a more uh, easy, in an easier way and more, yeah, easier way. Um, so I don't enter into the detail here, but be aware that if you intend to, to test and to use this, uh, microservice architecture. Uh, we are using uh, Insomnia and we have shared uh, the configuration that is required to test uh, the whole series of crude methods um, for the this uh, microservice. Uh, so it's shared on, again on the GitHub of the OSDC. So it's available for you if you want uh, to to do the test. Just one note, you need to follow, if you do, do the sequence, which is here, you need to follow a given, um, a given order. And this is described here. I don't enter into detail more here. So now focusing a little bit on uh, the correction of raw metal measurement. So, um, so the code that Eric, uh, uh, so who's Eric has, has been presenting the, the main uh, theory and functionalities has been developed in .NET, .NET 6, uh, and is available as a .NET 6 solution on the OSDC GitHub. It's developed in C Sharp, and for the deployment, we use Docker, the containerization tool, but also two other tools uh, I won't describe here, but that allows you to orchestrate uh, different uh, Docker containers together. Uh, the source code is available here. For the web design, because for each of the microservices we design, we implement, we need to basically test the microservice itself, but we also need to verify that the results of the algorithms are good and are correct. And to do this, we usually need to have a user interface. We need to plot results uh, and to, yeah, to visualize them in a nice way so that we can verify that uh, the results are what we expect. So we have implemented for this microservice, but we do that for all of them, uh, a web application, which has been developed uh, with a technology which is called Blazor, uh, developed uh, by Microsoft and which is closely related to the .NET uh, community and the .NET environment. Um, and that allows you to develop web apps without having to handle complex JavaScript or any other web design language, uh, you can just stick to simple HTML and all the complex functionalities are developed within C Sharp, which is very convenient for us because we basically need to learn C Sharp and HTML and that's it. We don't need to add the J JavaScript layer. So that's very convenient uh, for people uh, developing into C Sharp. And regarding the data storage, which is attached to this microservice as any microservices, we use SQLite, which has the advantage of be very easily uh, configurable and very light when you need to uh, apply this to a given uh, microservice. So in this correction uh, of rheometer uh, measurements, we have three different types, three main types of data objects that we, that we are manipulating. Uh, the rheograms, YPL calibration and YPL correction. And what I want to insist on here is that basically when we have designed this program. Uh, these objects here correspond to classes. This is object-oriented programming here. And these classes contain both the input data and the output data. So basically when you open, when you look into the, the code of a railgram, you will see the inputs, which are the rail meter measurements, and the outputs, which are the corrected flow curve that have been described by Eric last time, but also the calibrated 
uh, yield power low or Herschel Barclay model that correspond to this flow curve. And what, what I want to stress on here is that basically, if you remember this sketch of the user interface that generates and defines the data here, when we create a new data in the user and we ask the user, please fill in the parameters that are associated to the data, we ask the user to fill in this part, the input data. But in the background, we have also initialized output data. And for the, at the beginning, of course, there these are empty or no, okay? But the user is not aware of that. When the user in the user interface click on compute button, it automatically sends this process I've been describing uh, for the microservice architecture. He basically sent this data with filled in input data and empty output data to the microservice YPL calibration formulator. The YPL calibration formulator is responsible for uh, executing the algorithm, he is responsible for filling in the output data here and sending back the realgram with the output data uh, available to the user interface. And this is how it works. This is not necessarily, you are not forced to uh, implement things like this. You could have output data in another class, if you wish. That's a choice for myself, but I wanted to insist on that back because this is how the whole process works. You create data, you send to a given uh, processing unit, which is the microservice, and you retrieve the result back. This is how it works. And this, the same goes with the other type of objects. Um, so you will have here the endpoints for the microservice. If you want to just access the microservice, and I showed you the tools that are, are uh, the most uh, useful when you want to test a microservice. So for example, Insomnia or Postman. And you have the uh, web app endpoint where you will be able to play visually with all these objects and create them, list them, load them, and visualize the results. But remember, the web app we have been implementing, it's just one client among others. If you want to develop your own web app based on our macro service here, you can do this, definitely. You just have to uh, build the infrastructure that allows you to convert your own data model into JSON, and then you just send request, HTTP request, get, post, put, delete to our microservice, which is available on a given uh, North server, and that make it also. Um, so you have some documentation which is available online, uh, just as other um, uh, models available on the, uh, uh, the OSDC uh, GitHub. And we have a wiki also, which is under construction uh, with a tutorial, like a step-by-step -step tutorial uh, for the use of the application. But you have already a, a bunch of information here. Um, uh, so now let's go to, um, just to have a quick uh, overview. Yeah, it's almost time, but I will continue though. Um, I'll try to, to accelerate a little bit. Um, so here is the structure. I wanted to show you that uh, of the, the program that we have been putting on the OSDC GitHub. Uh, we have the base model, which is called model. And this is where the data model is implemented. So the main classes and also the algorithms, the calculations. We have another um, project module, which is called service and which is the microservice properly. And this is where all the controllers and the managers of the data are implemented. And they have basically, they uh, deal with the access to the data and send the results uh, to any client, the web app client in particular, which is here. We have also, you will see that there is a desktop application here. This is not the web app. This is a desktop application, which has been implemented historically to initially to test the program uh, in a different way. So this is another client of, uh, of, the, of the application. We have a functional test 
uh, project, which is um, which is implemented here, uh, that allows to test the basically the microservice programmatically. So this is an interest uh, interesting uh, um, case study for you if you intend to um, to follow the same uh, same approach. We have some unit tests uh, that are basically a lower level uh, test that verifies that your computation uh, do exactly as what is planned, but at the very low level. So this is uh, useful because this can be uh, automated very easily. So we have used the uh, nUnit uh, library to uh, automate these tests. And then we have um, the infrastructure, the, yeah, three different projects which are there to make this conversion from the base model to the JSON model. So I will describe this right after. So first, the controller. I want here to show you that, OK, this is source code. So this can be a little bit frightening. But actually, this is not. Uh, this is the core purpose of the microservice. These are the controllers. This is how you access the microservice. And basically, with what you have on the left and on the right, you can access the microservice. So this is very, very important. As you can see, so here I have um, uh, hide uh, a little bit of the code. But the first, the post method, which is here, if you expand it, it's actually only a few lines of code. And what do you have here? You have basically your crude methods. And what do they do? They help you communicate through the JSON format. So we have an infrastructure here, which is responsible in .NET to make the conversion with, between the data objects, which are here. So for example, Rheogram, this is a class, which is understood by the microservice. But here we have an annotation, which is something very specific to .NET, that do the conversion into JSON automatically for us. And you will have such infrastructure uh, available in other languages. Uh, so basically, you have this simple method here. And you, if you expand it, you see what does the post method. Basically, it retrieves a given, um, a given um, data uh, corresponding to a given value and tries to add it to uh, the database thanks to a real gram manager. And what, so we have used this notion of manager. Uh, what is the manager? Basically, the manager is the, the, the class to which we have delegated all the hard stuff, the algorithms, uh, pre-processing the data, post-processing the data. Um, this is done by the manager. And the manager does all the calls that are necessary to do that. But what is interesting here is that all of you here who have implemented scientific application uh, have implemented in some way a manager that is responsible to handle the whole computation stuff. So what is interesting here is that basically here you have your monolithic application, which is inside this line of code. It can be complex. Huh? It can do complex things. But the microservice part of the problem is only this, basically. So you need to set up the infrastructure for this and you need, okay, you need, you have a few of bunch of configuration to do here to have this so simple interface. But when it's done, when it's implemented for one microservice, basically you will just copy paste this same infrastructure for any other microservice that you will implement. And this is the microservice part. So this is where at the beginning that might be frightening and complex to configure, but once you, once you have done that once, it's straightforward. And you can then focus on the logic of your application, which is hidden here, but which is no different from what you have done before. Um, OK, an important part, so I, I stop a little bit on this, because this is very important. This is the conversion between the data model, the base model, which contained basically the classes of your model, and the methods, so all the algorithms. They are included in your model. This is where all your 
functions, procedures, methods, whatever you want to call them, are, are implemented. This is used by the microservice internally. So the microservice itself, so the service, depends on the model, the base model, so that it can compute and launch these computations. But what we expose to the outside world is not the base model, because we don't want to expose the logic. We only expose the data classes. And this is a, a standard way of, um, of doing in the software engineering world. And we call, this is sometimes called, so for C Sharp, this is called POCO, a way of uh, presenting the model, uh, which means plain old C Sharp object, where only the classes, only the attributes of the, the, the model are exposed, not the method. You don't want to expose the, the functions or the method. You don't want to expose the logic for different reason. Uh, it can be for confidential reason. So you are ready to expose your microservice and to let people use this, use it, but you don't want people to know what's inside your model. You just expose the classes, how to define the data, but not how to run and handle and manipulate the data. But it can also, if you are not, uh, if, it's, if confidentiality is not a problem for you, uh, you this can also be uh, very interesting for the sake of modularity because not exposing the logic is also a guarantee that you don't let the freedom to any people in the outside world to manipulate e himself the logic you are responsible for the logic of your own microservice and you know how to do it. This is not to others to do that. If they want to modify your logic, they just reprogram your code and do another microservice. But once your microservice is deployed, it's self-consistent. It its logic should not be exposed. So this is for the sake of security of your code and consistency of what you are proposing to the outside world. Uh, so yeah, this concept is important. And we have uh, in the code, you will see that we have basically a program here that convert the model into JSON. This is this code here. And we have the uh, invert operation, which is done here. So these two projects here do the conversion that I was presenting in the sketch at the beginning, if you remember. Uh, these are two very simple programs. You will see that there are only a few lines of code, but these are very important piece of the whole uh, process. Um, okay, so I will, yeah, I will try to, to go fast. So here are just um, different views. So basically this architecture we have been using for YPL calibration from Aerometer, we have been using it uh, for almost two years now, and we have been applying it to different kind of uh, process and algorithms. And so here, and you can see here that this same structure has been implemented. You, you can recognize the same uh, model. So we have applied the same structure to all different kind of microservice applications that deals with totally different data and algorithms, survey instruments. So here we are defining sub survey instruments. This has nothing to do with uh, materiology, definitely. Uh, we are defining well bores here or well concepts, etc. I don't enter into the details, but basically what we have been building through the years is a template that is applicable to all of this. And that comes with a default structure with a default data model, which is very, very simple but that allows you, if you are intent to develop in C-sharp, because this is developed in C-sharp, that gives you, provides you data model, default data model, default microservice, default web app, and the conversion features here. Uh, and that can be run from the start. And then once you have applied this template, you can start building and making the model more complex and adapting the web app to your needs. But you have the whole base infrastructure which is implemented already for you here. So this will be donated uh, uh, soon to the OSDC. We need to 
to to to update this because this is versioned and it's been a while since uh, we have not been uh, upgraded it. So YPL calibration from Meter is one of the last version of the uh, the struct microservice structure that we have been implementing. This has not been um, uh, upgraded into the template. So this is why this is not made available today, but this will come, this will come and available the same on the same GitHub. Uh, another important piece that you will see uh, is available in this microservice uh, YPL calibration from Reometer is the drilling unit conversion microservice because this also is a microservice and as you can see here this follow approximately the same architecture here uh, this is already donated to the OSDC so this is already available on the OSDC github and you can already play with the microservice or the web app here and what is very important here is that basically here you have a complete unit system manager that is available for you. Uh, we have been implementing, Eric Kayo has been implementing mostly uh, most of this, and you have uh, access to different unit system, whether it is US, Imperial, SI, or custom unit system. So you can build your own unit system where you decide that, for example, the torque unit will be, I don't know, K, K, uh, yeah. A pound foot, um, uh, foot, yeah, okay, Newton meter, <laughs> that would be easier for me, uh, Newton meter or whatever, and you, you make the association beca between a, a given physical quantity or a drilling physical quantity and a given unit. And this will be saved and available for you uh, as you are running or developing your own application. Uh, there is also another, two other, so, Another very important feature. So the first one I've been just mentioning is this one. The second one is the data unit conversion sets. This offers you the capability to send your data. Let's say you are working with your own microservice on your side and you have data that have been defined in SI units. You want to convert them into a given unit system you can package this data, convert this data into the appropriate JSON format that is again available here. Send this vector of data, these are your data, I insist, to the unit conversion microservice that is deployed on a North server here. And the conversion will be made for you on all this data. This can be one value, but this can be thousands or tens of thousands of values that will be converted. And these values can be representative of one data, for example, torque data. You have a vector of thousand numerical value for a given torque, but you can concatenate this to a weight and bit value. For example, you have 100 other values that are homogeneous to a weight and bit and et cetera, et cetera. Whatever number, whatever type of quantity you want to send and convert, you can do it provided that you respect the JSON schema of this particular microservice. So this is very powerful. Have a look at it. This could be very useful if you don't want to implement this yourself because this is really time consuming. Uh, and I will go very quick on the second application, but this is just basically to show you uh, the difference between this microservice, YPL calibration from Reometer, which is only one microservice. It doesn't communicate right now with other microservices, but in the, in, within the two year period that I was mentioning earlier, we have been implemented a lot of microservices that communicate together uh, and this is related to automated drilling engineering. So there are, the motivations are here. Basically, this is a bunch of microservices, a series or, of microservices that intend to deal with uncertainty in, uh, in geo, geo, geology and geoscience and geophysics in, uh, in the well planning and also drilling uncertainties. And at the well planning, basically, you have a lot of possibilities to, um, to construct your well, to design, to design where you want to drill, depending on 
what uh, the GNG department is telling you, whatever the drilling department is telling you, you will have different constraints. You will have also from operations constraints on the clusters and uh, the slots that you will be using on a given field or in a given platform. Uh, and basically the microservice architecture we are building uh, try to handle all this complex information to propose automated and ensembled solution of uh, potential well path that and well trajectories that will be computed um, and also compute anti-collision uh, between these uh, trajectories. Uh, and okay, this is a complex thing. This is hard for me to explain it in a few seconds, but basically you have a lot of different components here. And here is a view of these components. As you can see, uh, you have a lot of them. Uh, you there are some. Um, so all of these bricks here are not all of them are developed right now. Approximately half of them. Uh, but some of these bricks are related to target definition. Some are related to field or cartographic projection or geodetic system definition. Some others are related to the definition of a well path or trajectory. Some others to computation of anti collision and some others to the definition of drill string component, et cetera, et cetera. And they all follow the microservice architecture design pattern. And they all, so for those of which are already implemented, they communicate through this uh, HTTP uh, request um, and answer uh, that I've been uh, describing. The very important point that, so this looks complex, right? Because there are a lot of dependencies between these bricks. But what is very convenient with the microservice architecture is that we are able to incrementally develop these bricks one after the other. And we are in, able to test each of them one by one. And that can be that is very convenient. Imagine that if it were a monolithic application, we should be very careful. This would be definitely possible. But we should be very careful that we are not uh, coupling too much, uh, for example, target to target group or well concept to well. Otherwise, when we realize that we want to, for example, couple well concept to cluster, we need to break, for example, a strong dependency that has been uh, set between well concept and well. And this is where microservice architecture helps us to, from the start, to think differently. We need to think in terms of crude API. What do I need to deliver in terms of get, post, put, and delete method? This is very simple. And if, if you make this effort of keeping it very simple from the beginning, this helps you to handle complexity afterwards. Note that this data model, at least part of it, uh, is being shared within the OSDC. It's under development. So if you go to this address, you won't see uh, much right now, but it's under development. And this, uh, this is, uh, yeah, this, is, this will be uh, also uh, shared in the long run. So to conclude, and sorry for being so late, but there are pros and cons to microservice architecture. Let me just summarize them. Uh, by construction, API is simple and easy to understand. Uh, also, also there, although there are a bunch of projects, as you have seen in the uh, um, microservice architecture, the code base where the model and the logic is implemented is actually very small. So it's very easy to focus. For example, if you're a uh, research engineer, or scientists um, uh, need to focus on their algorithm. This is actually a very isolated and very small part of the whole microservice architecture implementation I've been showing to you. The rest is basically automatically implemented, except for the web app, which is always time consuming because you need to adapt it to what kind of data you are manipulating and visualizing. But for the rest, it's really the code base is very small. Logic is not exposed. Okay, I don't come back on this. Uh, and once you have started and 
uh, implemented the first infrastructure, there's no additional effort to uh, apply this to, uh, to future microservice. Uh, and the deployment, once everything is set up for the first time, again, uh, is very simple. But there are cons also. Uh, once the logic get complex, uh, as you have seen with the implementation of the automated drilling engineering I've been showing you, but probably not more than a monolithic application. Where it's definitely more complicated, but we are not there yet too much with our current existing infrastructure I've been showing you, is when communication channels need to increase in complexity for different reasons. And there are many reasons actually. For example, these microservices, they communicate together and since we are talking about scientific applications, we will send a request to execute algorithms. We will to wait for these algorithms to, uh, to go to an end before we get the results. So here you see that there will be some uh, waiting mechanism that you need to put in place so that when you try to get the results, you have wait, you have waited, but you have not stopped or give a halt to another microservice. So this can start getting more complex. We have not been implementing this yet, but we, are being, we, are, we will be working on this. The same notification system. Uh, as a data disappeared from a given microservice database, maybe we should notify other microservices that will use this data and reference this GUID of the data that have been deleted somewhere else that, okay, this is not existing anymore. This is not necessary. You could implement in this other microservices mechanism that deals with an absent data, but this is maybe interesting to have a notification that does that automatically every 10 seconds, one hour, one week, one year, whatever. So this also needs to be uh, uh, thought about. Authentication. We are talking about one microservice that where the database is shared and is particular to this microservice. But if you share it between different users, that could cause a problem of security of confidentiality. So you need to authenticate properly. Uh, again, no, not again. I never talk about that. Performance analysis. Uh, we are sending data through the network. We need to monitor how much if these are heavy data like simulation results, this can be a problem from the network perspective. So again, this has to be accounted for. Whereas for a monolithic architecture, you wouldn't care about that. You, wouldn't, you would only care about uh, the memory which is available on your given laptop or cluster for computation. So this is different approach. And again, parallel computing, if you want to um, deploy a given microservice on different, different uh, to scale it up so that you benefit from uh, computation which are run in parallel, this would need to, uh, this will require a yeah, specific uh, infrastructure. So this needs to be addressed. We have not addressed this yet, but I know, we know this is on the, on the list. And final word, um, if you look for literature on microservices, Basically, in the scientific community, you won't find much. 99% of the do documentation concerns commercial application, which is a problem for us. But still, you can try to adapt what the information which is here. I just uh, mentioned this one, which is very interesting that you uh, is related to scientific application. Uh, for your knowledge, you could you could ask, okay, is the drilling industry really interested in this? Yes, actually. Uh, several companies are considering working on that in a quite uh, um, a proactive way, uh, KBP, Total Energy, or Ali Burton, to name a few. Uh, in the drilling community, you won't find almost nothing. Talking about uh, this approach, you will find uh, so one reference, uh, so um, where this um, same YPL calibration from a meta application has been described, actually. So this was uh, quite a few years ago already, um, but um, 
this was uh, this is described, and there is this most uh, recent one where uh, this uh, kind of um, microservice approach has been uh, implemented and it's uh, described. So I will stop here. Um, sorry for being so late, and thanks for so for keeping here. Um, I'm available for any question you you would have now. If you have any. No. So if uh, no question. Thank you, Jim. That yes. was a <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I think uh, we are going to leave it here. And uh, okay, if you have any question that comes to your mind later on, uh, do not hesitate to contact me or, or Eric. And uh, that will be a pleasure to, to share what we have learned so far on this with you. Bye-bye. Very nice overview. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Gilles. Bye. Bye.